We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everyone and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aaron Butler and welcome to the session entitled Human Rights Based Database Systems. Um, I will be speaking along with my co-speaker, um, Evelyn Tauchner, um, who, as I've been informed, is running late for the session um, due to uh, waiting for uh, results, test results uh, for, for a COVID test, as I understand it. She should be here shortly. Um, I shall go ahead and begin without her. And I thank you everyone for your patience. So today's presentation um, will be that uh, will be based on a book written by Professor Dr. Uh, Kirschleger from University of Lucerne, um, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. And so Dr. Tauknitz and I, Tauknitz and I are speaking in his stead. The title of the book is Digital Transformation and Ethics, Ethical Considerations on the Robotization and Automation of Society and the Economy and the Use of Artificial Intelligence. From this book, we'll be presenting uh, two sections. Uh, I will take one and Dr. Tafnitz will take the other. But first let's begin with, and then we will move on to a discussion. But first let's begin with getting a greater understanding of the overall problem horizon of the book. The book focuses on database systems and artificial intelligence. And as such, it deals with the following problem horizon. Given the intertwinement of these two technologies, with human affairs and endeavors, we are at a critical phase in which digital transformation and its effect on human affairs and endeavors can be pursued with greater fervor, can take, be taken more seriously in order to address the various ethical chances and risks. As such, the research question of the entire book is as follows. How can we best navigate the intertwinement of digital transformation in human affairs and endeavors so as to better protect and promote human dignity, freedom, and well being in the age of the fourth industrial revolution? Accordingly, the aim of the book is to consider from an ethical perspective the need and possibility of human rights as an integral feature of the intertwinement of digital transformation and human affairs and endeavors. As I mentioned, we will be focusing on two sections. The first is human rights-based database systems. And the second is the International Database Systems Agency. And as I understand it, uh, as, as we had planned before, uh, Dr. Tauknitz will be presenting on the first section. I don't believe she's with us yet. Let me just check for a moment. Uh, no, she, she is not with us yet. So I shall proceed in presenting this section then in her stead. So we began with understanding what a database is. The database is an organized collection of structured information um, or data, typically stored and accessed electronically from a computer system. Now that's the standard definition that one finds from organizations such as Oracle. You can also find the same thing on the IBM website, um, as well as other web, as well as the websites of other companies. It's a standard definition um, for a database system. Now, as such. We don't want to just address what a database system is or the nature of a database system um, as such. We want to address it 
from an ethical perspective. And so we'll be starting with addressing the nature of AI and in an attempt to disentangle that and understanding of that from an ethical perspective from that of a database system, also from an ethical perspective. So the term AI is questionable, first of all. One, um, we don't have a complete understanding of what intelligence is and the systems that we design based on our understanding to date um, has certain uh, cognitive uh, capabilities which are limited. Uh, one, and one limitation is the lack of moral capability. Another way to understand the limitations of artificial intelligence in its current form, um, as opposed to its idealized forms, um, would be many existing artificial intelligence systems today can solve problems um, across, cannot solve problems across novel domains. They're designed specifically to solve problems within one restricted domain. But the general ability to address novelty across multiple domains, which is something that humans do all the time, is not an ability possessed by such systems. Now, there's been a lot of talk recently about trust in AI and trustworthiness of such systems. But from an ethical perspective, these sorts of systems, these sorts of machines cannot be considered to be uh, trustworthy. That's a property that only humans have. Um, for to be trustworthy implies the ability to betray the person that is trusting the trustee. And such systems due to one, their lack of general intelligence and their restricted capacities do not have the, of course, do not have the possibility to betray their, their users. Except of, of course, in art of, in science fiction scenarios, but not in, not, in the, not in the real world. So one thing that an AI can do, however, is it can solve problems within a restricted domain and it can do that actually very well. Um, the current systems that we have um, can um, produce, uh, can predict certain behaviors, can predict certain outcomes, of course, within a restricted domain. Um, for example, they can help us with um, natural language programming problems. Of course, many of you probably realize that in using software online, uh, Word software such as Microsoft Word and, and, and the like. And such systems are very good uh, at that. Um, they can also track information and, and, and track data even in the natural environment, uh, tracking the topography of a terrain and these sorts of, this, and these sorts of things. But now humans use database systems uh, to support us in making decisions and such systems, but we need to be empowered to think critically about the usage of such systems. Um, excuse me for a moment, everyone. Dr. Taufnitz is attempting to uh, enter the forum. I'm getting a message for, from her, excuse me. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, moving on, um, I'm waiting for an update from Dr. Tuckness. So human rights based database systems, as opposed to just simply database systems, are systems by their design, production and deployment are systems that would 
ideally take human rights into account in their ethically aligned design. As such, and their importance is as follows. They would have a baseline minimum standard of promoting and protecting human dignity. This would include the right, uh, rights to, to privacy and protection from abuse. And they would empower free speech, ideally. And they would, as a minimum, taking human rights seriously as a minimum standard, ethical standard, um, would hold governments and other institutions accountable for operating below that minimum standard. One of the advantages that is offered by such systems is that they can help to, insofar as they take human rights seriously, they can help to determine the content of our legal norms and they have universal applicability under the various circumstances in which such systems would be used and they are recognized globally as a sort of ethical standard uh, that we are to follow. Now, moving on to address the following question, which human rights are concerned when it comes to digital technologies? Specifically, it's the right to privacy and data protection, right to be forgotten, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, rights of persons with disabilities, gender rights online, and children rights. And of course, these are the same rights that would be protected offline as well. So one of the benefits of having human rights-based database systems is that they can create uniformity of taking seriously, promoting and protecting human rights, both offline and online. Some examples um, that Dr. Tauchnitz um, has, has prepared for us for her, for her portion of the presentation is exclusion of the possibility that humans should be able to sell themselves and their data as well as their privacy as products. Of course, this would restrict the nature of data ownership. But in doing so, it would make the very practice of this, the relevant practice, more in line with human rights standards. Another example would be avoidance of critical system vulnerabilities that allow surveillance of individuals. Um, that's of course been in the been in the news as a peculiar as a peculiar problem of the last decade. This would include creating video conferencing software that would have less vulnerabilities to be used as a as a way of spying on people. For example, this would in include having such software that would not, for example, have back doors to certain agencies that would be concerned with spying on the populace. Moreover, another example would be a search for a profitable business model or models that would not violate human rights. That is to say that would take seriously human rights as a minimum ethical standard. Some key takeaway points to keep in mind is that this approach as recommended by Professor Dr. Kirschleger is a precautionary approach which reinforce existing human rights. So he is not presuming to sort of reinvent the wheel if you will. Um, but as was mentioned at the outset of the discussion thus far, this is an opportunity to take human rights uh, more seriously. And specifically what that means is attempting to provide recommendations to embed human rights and human rights practices more deeply at different levels of the development of the design, development, and deployment of human right, of human of database systems. This would include promoting algorithms that are less biased that insofar as they take human rights as a minimum standard, do not contain certain biases that disadvantage vulnerable groups, which has also been a problem of the last decade.
We move now to the portion of the talk um, that I'll be presenting uh, that we originally planned. Um, that is to say, talking about the International Database Systems Agency. And um, afterwards, I would like to open up the floor for discussion. Uh, critical discussion of these matters is, is very important, especially at such a venue like the uh, Internet Governance Forum. And I'm looking forward to getting to that portion of the presentation so that I can, uh, we can all discuss this together and I can hear feedback from the audience as to uh, your thoughts concerning these matters. Uh, before we proceed, let me just check to make sure. Ah, Professor Tauknitz is in. Um, Dr. Tauknitz, are you, are you there? Yes, hi, Aaron. Finally ah. arrived. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we just finished your section and I'm moving on to my own. Okay, good. Okay. And then after that, we'll open up the floor for a critical discussion. It's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. And if there are any questions, of course, um, to my part, um, I'm happy to address them during the either on online or also with the participants being here in Katowice. Thank you. So moving on to the second part of the presentation, the International Database Systems Agency. So what and why is this important? The agency in question in its conception is to be is considered to be a global supervisory monitoring institution in the area of database systems. And its purpose is to ensure safe, secure, and peaceful use of database systems, to contribute to international peace and security by, again, adhering to human rights as a minimum standard. And it is also designed to promote respect for human rights and to be in line with, that is to say consistent with, and to promote the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But how would this work? The agency in its conception is designed to implement 30 principles of application. So these are applied principles. And they serve a necessary function of enforcement of increased and stricter commitment to the legal framework, of course, as consistent with human rights as, an, as a minimum ethical standard. And they provide a, a means of strengthening regulation that is more precise and goal-oriented, and most importantly, from an ethical perspective. This last point is, is rather important. As we know that, and as history can attest to, the content of legal norms in their ability to protect and promote human rights need to be determined from an ethical perspective. Of course, legal norms can be determined from any perspective. Right? And that's, that's partly, partly the problem. The problem is that we need to fix it so that it's being, its content is being determined from an ethical perspective. And one of, one of the best ways to do that is to take as germane to that uh, activity human rights as a minimum ethical standard. So, but these 30 principles of application are themselves grounded in certain first principles from this ethical perspective to which I'm referring. And these can be grouped into five principles. So human rights as a minimum ethical standard, which I've mentioned several times, um, and cannot be repeated enough. That's very, very important. Um, explainability, can turn, fulfilling ethically viable social requirements. And I'll explain that in a moment when we consider an example. Uh, critical safety considerations, of course, and the indivisibility of these principles. That is to say, a way of blocking, picking and choosing which principles one of human rights that one wants to take seriously. They must be considered from a holistic perspective, that is. And a human rights compliant conception of justice for example, one of which that would make it unjust to apply human rights to some group and not another group. So let's take an example. We'll consider three principles. 
Uh, I've paraphrased these for, for the presentation. And what I'm going to try to do here is to show how these principles are, are founded in, how these principles of application are founded in the first principles of an ethical perspective uh, to which I just referred. Uh, to which I just referred, excuse me. So the principle of the DSA, the Database Systems Agency, principles thereof must include the parameter settings of the developmental cycle, must be included in the, in the parameter settings of the developmental cycle of database systems. Now that can be grounded, for example, in the first principle mentioned, human rights is a minimum ethical standard. That is to say, in all parts of the design. So again, this is speaking to ethically aligned design, that in its design, at, at all aspects of its design, and development of such systems, it must be done in such a way that in addition to meeting the system requirements, the technical system requirements, it must also meet the requirement of filling the conditions of satisfaction of human rights. Principle 26, of course, works in conjunction with this, that all design, production, provision, operation, infrastructural, data analytics companies and stakeholders must have relevant knowledge. Of course, we expect this in it even today, but not just relevant knowledge and competency and skills of a technical nature, but to hold them by a higher standard. That is to say, having skills also in applied ethics, having these sorts of expertise as expertise that are germane to developing the sorts of systems that we want to be used in the public space. So one example of, so how this applies actually, um, and just this will just explain some of the rational motivation behind this. So that pr principle 26 can be grounded in the explainability requirement. And the rational motivation behind that is as follows. And this is borrowing from the work of, Nick's, of uh, the philosopher of artificial intelligence, Nick Bostrom. Whenever we want to use such systems in the public space, they must fulfill the ethical, the social requirements of that usage. And many of these social requirements are ethical in nature. I'll give you an example. There, is, there has been a problem uh, that's being addressed by a research group in a Brown University, I believe, a problem existing in the United States of using such systems um, to determine recidivism. And recidivism, of course, is if someone has been to prison, their likelihood of returning to prison. So one of the problems, and this is an example of what not to do and why we need to take human rights as a minimum standard more seriously with respect to such systems and their use in the public space, is that these systems as they, were, as they have been used, I believe it's in the state of Illinois in, in the Midwest, they were used in such a way, or they were designed in such a way as to have a biased algorithms. And one of the results of these, of this bias in the algorithm design is that it was automatically weighting as more likely persons in virtue, persons who belong to a particular demographic group in virtue of belonging to that group. So for example, African-Americans and Latinos were more likely to return to prison if they have been in prison. Um, they were rated with a greater likeliness, a higher likelihood than, for example, their white counterparts um, or members of another dem demographic group within the United States. And this, of course, would be something that we don't want. And the idea here is that if we um, increase the fervor of our efforts in embedding human rights into the design of these systems, into our conception of ethically aligned design. The idea is that hopefully that would uh, ameliorate this problem and perhaps and, and ideally remedy it entirely. The last principle is all relevant stakeholders must be held accountable. And that is to say they all must take ethical responsibility. This principle is grounded in the human rights compliant conception of justice. That is to say, no one gets off the hook. Uh, there could be no buck passing of responsibility. All must be held accountable. And the idea, of course, is that the, 
database systems agency would work to strengthen the legal framework in order to make it harder for various members and stakeholders at different levels of the design and development of such systems and their deployment in the public space can sort of get off the hook of taking responsibility for the unethical outcomes of such systems. One way to think about this agency is that it would function analogously to already existing agencies. It would function analogously to the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as a, a more local agency, the American uh, Federal Aviation Administration. And it would function as the Montreal Protocol of 1987, uh, outlawing the use of CFCs in order to protect the ozone layer. And as such, it would share in the common features of these organizations. That is to say, it would have concrete regulations and concrete mechanisms of enforcement, as well as international support and cooperation. I would like to thank everyone uh, for your patience in listening to this presentation. I would now like to move to the discussion session and we can perhaps open the floor um, for, for uh, feedback from the audience. Uh, Dr. Tauknitz, would you like to uh, proceed first? Yes, of course, thank you. So um, yeah, maybe the slide with the discussion points again, so I can see yep. it, yes, thank you. So um, yeah, something we have been talking about when we also in preparation of this presentation is really um, whether the focus of human rights as a minimum standard is enough or if we would need some additional principles, for example, based on uh, justice and responsibility from an ethical point of view. So to say is like uh, the focus on human rights already covering um, our, our uh, need for ethical principles or do we need something else in addition? Or I would like to take the, se the second question to it directly, ask the other way around, like, if digital technologies would be designed, developed and used in a way as to fully respect and promote human rights, would there still be any need for additional guidelines? Because we often see that, um, especially in the, in the corporate world, that uh, private companies or organizations at a national and regional level, they have um, ethical guidelines apart from human rights. And um, so asking that way, what is the additional value of that? Or are we not um, just duplicating efforts there? Because um, as, um, as my colleague has probably mentioned to you while I was still not here, um, that uh, human rights offered a significant advantage of already being um, legally binding, of offering a legal a framework that we can build on and that has already been um, recognized on international level by by virtually all states so um, how does human rights and ethics uh, connect there and Aaron do you want to read out the other two sentences or uh, should we first discuss these couple and then move on what what do you suggest um, I suggest that we go ahead and discuss the, the the two that you mentioned and then we can move on Okay, great. So please feel free, either uh, particip participants online to, to leave your comments or raise your hand or people here in the room as well. Uh, yes, um, Elena Chola. Yes, thank you, Aaron, for the insightful discussion. I don't know whether I can check my video on. Okay, thank you for the insightful discussion. I think one thing that uh, I want to ask, especially with regard to your uh, previous point when it comes to the legal frameworks for enforcing the the AI and the bio system that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, mine more or less like a discussion, not really a question per se, but uh, uh, some of this AI and also some of these uh, technologies, I think they transcend across geographies and also through nations. Uh, and also you are mentioning the analogous system on how to, how that this model is trying to, 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 to use. And I'm imagining like a system, 
totally from Kenya and I'm imagining a system where in Africa sometimes people are in governments where the uh, definition of human rights is keep, keeps on changing. So imagining how does that system works. So uh, its implementation might actually be be interpreted differently and also who defines these human rights. I think those are questions which I think also need to be discussed and also the model. Uh, for, for instance, now even you're talking about the me for instance the 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 firearms also on the, the atomic weapons so which are algorithm based who gets who gets to be responsible do you i know you are mentioning about everyone uh, being accountable mm -hmm. but again who bears the greatest responsibilities is the person who pressed the the send button or who the who manufactured the 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 weapon or who designed the algorithms i think those are questions which i think uh, Yes, I'm through our also just anyone also can also come in and chime in also in some of those discussions. But, but nonetheless, very good to have this discussion at the IGF. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your comments and, and questions. Um, Dr. Tafnitz, would you like to uh, begin? Um, I think an important point is, um, yeah, the question about implementation. Because one thing is you we have maybe human rights frameworks that are in place and well recognized um, at least formally in the within the United Nations, but uh, then the huge question is of course how do we get it implemented and um, what does responsible technolo technology mean? Like, um, is it the the people behind it who are designing it, as he just mentioned, or is it uh, the ones who are actually giving uh, the 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 orders? No, or like who to which when it when and how it is to be used and um, I think it's really about um, getting things from the paper to to the to the real world so to say and um, I think there it's also important to to talk about the the right to remedy like if um, if harm does happen or if somebody is discriminated like um, is there any access for for remedy, like what happens in that case, or any any enforcement um, possibility, which is also going to be um, another discussion point, which we mentioned there. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things to to also keep in mind, and, and this is actually a question, and uh, this will this will further, hopefully, this will further uh, Mr. Ocello's point. Um, so we, we have existing bodies, right? Like the GDPR uh, officers who, who are at various companies whose jobs is, who, is to basically enforce um, those standards and various other existing agencies. What benefit would then uh, the global agency or institution um, that uh, Professor Dr. Kirschlager is recommending would add to that? Um, would that help to shore up existing agencies? Would it replace them? Um, this is something that, that needs to be uh, uh, considered very carefully and is part of the, the, the inquiry as to the details of the enforcement mechanisms in order to ensure this. I mean, one, one benefit, for example, that such a global agency could have is that it could help coordinate the efforts at regional levels, right? Um, but is it necessary or, or is it superfluous? Uh, these are some things that, that, that need to be considered carefully. I just wanted to check the chat for a moment. I think someone has asked a question. Before we move on to this question, I just want to give uh, Mr. Ochoa, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And my apologies yes, if I'm not. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to give you a chance also to respond um, uh, to, uh, to, to I, I think, I, yeah, yeah, I think it's a very interesting dialogue because I, I would say, uh, I think also just having more voices also in this conversation is also a part of also the dialogue. I think that's what needs also to continue so that I think uh, when enforcing the human rights so that all, all voices are actually included in it, that's part of it. And also involving also, I think also to, to, to have my thinking is that probably even more government also needs to be brought on board in some of this enforceability. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't remain only a private sector driven initiative. 
so that uh, some of the policies also can also have some impact. Because I'm talking now, especially now from an African and also a Kenyan perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, like Kenya, I think we have implemented a data, but it's a young institution that I think was launched last year. So it's still a young one in the data, data protection agency just to ensure this data protection. But I think also we also need also those issues of strengthening this institution, knowing areas where uh, data protection needs to come. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it needs to be enforced. I know this GDPR, but I don't think I think also uh, the level of uh, the level of uh, let me say of its applicability and also enforceability in Africa specifically, I don't think it's that much high. So even the, if they are GDPR officers, they may not be able to. I think we're also just looking at the having inclusive world because I, algorithm transcends. My issue is algorithm transcends borders, and it's not something you easily lock in, like in US or maybe in Europe alone. It, it can even be enforced here enough, even anywhere. And so, issues about bias, issues about uh, issues uh, also about just the more voices also coming on board. I think that mm -hmm. is probably what I would actually really say at this time. Would you say also that it's a, a problem of um, the the ubiquity of the different mechanisms, right? So, I mean, the, an enforcement mechanism needs to be fully embedded at multiple levels and have a sense of ubiquity for it to really have the teeth it needs to to order in yes. order to function as an enforcement mechanism. Yes, even uh, from a policy perspective, I think the African Union just little this year, I think, is when they began forming out that AI tax force on maybe AI and assessing the harms and. Mm -hmm. and of this of this uh, of this ai system mm -hmm. so the discussion are still pretty at the infancy level especially in the african perspective but at least people are trying to at least there's that awareness i think one thing i like about the forum at least is it exposes these things into the open so that uh, policy makers can actually really know exactly what to implement so i think mm -hmm. the discussion is okay i mean because at least it's exposing where really people really need to actually point towards and also gives people direction where we have really need to focus on and also just bring in more voices. Yes. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to allow the person who, uh, uh, Marta Grabowski, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, I'll go ahead and read the question aloud. This is on the chat. Um, what would a relationship between this institute and the ETSI uh, be? Yes, this is my question. Because, because Etsy already has some standards mm. on ethics uh, and artificial intelligence. So what would be the relationship between these standards and this what the future institutes would be able to do? Mm. Um, Dr. Taubnitz, are you still with us? Pardon? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, um, that's in fact the exactly the the third discussion point that we listed there like mm -hmm. if we would have such international database systems agency as um the author of the book professor Kirschleder suggested or proposes um like who should that how should that be organized and there the, the question of an additional value of course is uh is significant and maybe it's a good um a good um moment to to lead over to this discussion point Mm -hmm. and also discuss in more depth um, as we are now at the IGF what the role of the IGF would be then because mm -hmm. um, like maybe there to distinguish there why we also listed there there's like different entry points I think because uh, one thing is you can enter more from the technology side and then set up um, like ethical guidelines and standards mm -hmm. or you can rather do it from the protection side which are human rights like, for instance, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights um, in Geneva, they're working a lot on translating human rights to the, to the digital space. So that is more the protection approach that focuses on the human and then asks um, what, um, what boundaries would technology have to, to respect. So do we rather want to go from the technology side? Uh, or do we rather go from the protection side? And um, if, because that has implications then, mm -hmm. like uh, where such a, international database systems agency could um, could uh, link up with or, or already build on or should it rather be a new separate agency I think is a good moment to discuss that yeah um, for 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 my part um, 
one thing that I would, and this is just a follow up, this dovetails uh, Dr. Tauchnitz's response. So the two vectors, namely on the technology side or the protection side, one advantage of, of such an agency as being suggested here is that um, it would seem as if both vectors of approach um, would be advantageous. And one of the things that such an agency can do is it can help to work with existing bodies um, in order to help uh, straddle both approaches to pursue them simultaneously. So one thing that it can, one purpose that it can serve is not, not, not so much to replace existing bodies, but as a means of coordinating collective intentionality towards improving the situation by concretely following both vectors or work streams, right? On the technology side and the protection side. That could be one, for example, one possible relationship that it could exist um, between um, the DSA and the institution in question. Uh, Mrs. Grabowski, Gr would you like to uh, follow up? Yes, thank you very much for, for your nation. But this was, in fact, I had in mind, it was that in some of the, um, of the, um, uh, of the, the standardization body, there are already some standards where the ethical issues are already included. Uh, you can find such standards where explicit ethical issues are mm -hmm. already included, the condition, mm -hmm. ethical conditions. Yeah. So the question is, if there is any cooperation or will be any cooperation or uh, how, I, I mean, uh, such a new institute uh, um, is going to undertake uh, some sort of a um, conversation or exchange of ideas with, with, with this uh, standard uh, organization, which is already quite advanced in producing yeah standards, yeah. including ethical issues already. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, so from, from my point of view, and I'm in, in many ways speaking for Professor Dr. Kirschlager, but one of the things, one of the, I think the main contributions that the DSA could make. Um, so if you imagine all of the different efforts, the different standards that already exist, um, sort of, uh, are weaved together and working in dialogue. So what, what we want then is, of course, increased uh, cooperation, um, increased strengthening or strengthening of collective action, uh, a tighter weave, if you will, so we can get a covering of the problem space. One of the benefits that I think that the DSA could, um, could offer is to help coordinate those efforts, right? So a lot of the a lot of the the examples that you mentioned are happening, they're happening at an international level as well, but they're also happening locally, right, and regionally, um, all around the world. One of the things that the DSA could do is not so much replace that, right? I mean, there's um, of course those things can be improved, but there's no need to replace them. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. But one of the things that the DSA can do is to help help contribute to coordinating those efforts. So we can have a, a truly global covering of the problem and a global improvement and optimization, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand, of course, yeah. but it is a huge task, I think, uh, yeah. to create such, such, such sort of institution because many, many bodies uh, have, a, I, I mean, uh, work out already some sort of uh, some ethical uh, um, rules which are yes. included in many, many official documents, which are already implemented in, yes. in projects yes. and other areas. So anyway, thank you very much for this clarification. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. And, <laughs> and I would also say that, that Professor Dr. Kirschlager does not uh, pr pretend that the situation would, would be easy. Of course, it would be difficult. Um, but once again, um, focusing on analogous organizations like the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, again, it, it's difficult. Of course, there are uh, regional mechanisms um, to, to help in this regard, but it, it has a, an effect of coordinating these efforts 
and of course that's not easy. It's not easy with with this agency, and it would it would certainly not be easy with the DSA as it's been as it's been recommended. Uh, but th thank you very much uh, for your for your comments. Thank you. Those thank are, you. It's very important. Um, maybe there's if another. I, can oh yes, I, please. Maybe I have something to that. I think um, some something which is really key also is to make um, all these existing efforts and standards. Um, also legally binding because often they're just on the recommendation level mm -hmm. or they're like um, more kind of um, like a nice to have thing or what is often referred to as soft law but um, it's really um, it's really key to to also make um, these standards and already existing norms legally binding because mm -hmm. if it's just uh, just a choice that for example uh, tech companies are also um, governments can can choose and pick which which standards do we like and which ones do we not like so much then we i don't think we really are where we want to be because um human rights are are not um, the most comfortable thing to to comply with i mean they're often uncomfortable for both for governments and for and for companies so we have to make sure that they're also um respected and um promoted when when it might not be that um, like that easy, so to say. So it shouldn't be a pick and choose. And that's a really a problem that I often see with uh, ethical standards and, and guidelines that they're all really nice, but um, it's rather kind of a pick and choose attitude, especially from, from private companies. And I think there it does make sense to try to make them legally binding and... Um, like also build an already existing normative frameworks, like for example, the UN guiding principles um, on human rights that specifically uh, address um, what human rights means for the, for the business world. And um, un unfortunately, they're not legally binding. This is mm -hmm. just the recommendation. So I think one task of such an agency could maybe also be to really um, like uh, go into the process of how can we meet make all these um, norms and standards legally binding and to guide this process. Uh, if I may, a word still, uh, if it would be under the United Nations uh, umbrella, of course, you will not be able to issue any binding legal acts. Mm. But for example, if it would be under, let's say the Council of Europe, so at least in some areas, it would be binding. So the problem, the additional problem is how, how, to, how to resolve the problem. And I mean, in the terms of the whole world, it's, it's, it's uh, from the legal point of view, it probably will not be, it, it will never be possible. There, there would be probably some sort of recommendation, which in some areas probably would be, uh, would be uh, discussed maybe, or even take that the consideration of, of uh, as a legal act, like for example, case of European institutions, mm. or in other cases, I mean, uh, no, it would be probably very difficult to obtain a label that it would be any binding law. Mm. Seems to me. If I can maybe um, uh, add to that, I'm, th that's really a an advantage, I think, if we already build on existing human rights frameworks, because at least the two pacts of 1966, there are legally bindings. I mean, that's treaty law, and all the signatory states of these two pacts of civil and political rights, and also of economic, social, and cultural rights in 1966. Um, these is treaty law and uh, binding. The problem is not so much the question um, like, how to kind of um, make make them leak it's it's not that the human rights are not legally right it's rather like how to apply them online mm -hmm. in the sense of how do we interpret that and how do we make sure that um, that they're respected and what happens if they're not respected mm -hmm. i think that is the big question here oh mm -hmm. yes thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much for your for your comments and questions. Um, we have seven minutes remaining. Could I follow up on something? Uh, yes, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, what else I just wanted also to maybe just to I agree with whatever everyone is mentioning, but uh, 
also when coming up with such a, a framework, it means we the DSA is more or less providing like a direction, like in terms of what the gold standard should be in terms of human rights protection. That is what I understand from this discussion. But uh, also, I think another question that also maybe someone, not me personally, but I'm sure maybe you can encounter in the future is which model do we, do we follow? Who, what are the best, what best practice do we have in terms of uh, uh, that can we can adopt or that we can follow where we, where we have probably come up with the lessons to come up with this human rights framework? Because I think that will also be something also that people will also definitely, definitely ask you, even if not at this forum, but I'm sure someone else somehow probably will, will want to know exactly if you're telling us to follow this direction where where have we seen it is being implemented or something like that. But also just also in the, in the spirit of uh, definitely, definitely uh, for it to to see the day of light, one thing that is quite certain, definitely there will have to be collaborations. It can't work independently uh, like they say in it. Uh, the organizations, so many, I know International Standards Association, they, they also, this body that does, that does standards, the formation of standards, I think they also involved also in AI algorithms or standards. I think they're pretty much global in everywhere. I think that's a more credible board when it comes to developing standards. I'm not sure how they are involved in terms of human rights, but I know generally in terms of standards, even just developing standards for like even the machines and everything, maybe you might have heard of them. So that is probably people who I think they might be relevant to, but also even just also offering also capacity building also, so that you just, just become only uh, one from one point also issues around capacity building or how do you also facilitate capacity building using the best model approach that you can direct people to that people are uh, in an organization can actually come and learn and go back and implement things that maybe when might be so hard to like maybe give direction to so those are some of my input when it comes to issues of dc mm -hmm. yes yes we have five minutes remaining um, one, one thing I would ask in response, actually, is um, with respect to, uh, uh, in response to, to your comments, uh, Mr. Uh, Ochoa, um, is in terms, of, in terms of developing a, a best practice model um, that, for example, that the, the, the DSA could follow in conjunction and working with other organizations, uh, already existing organizations and standards. What would be, what, in your opinion, what, what do you think would be the next concrete step in that regard? For example, that would help the situation on the African continent, let's say, for example. Uh, from the African content, uh, continent, let me, for instance, uh, most of these things are, uh, I would say they are still at the infancy level. So it, it has to be, it, there's no, no, most countries are probably just developing them from their own experience. For instance, I know Egypt, they're doing quite some work, even in Kenya. So it has to become at a conference level where people probably share their best practice forums. Where that is areas where I've seen people come and sharing their models and also publishing those models because people rely also if maybe I'm publishing, I know most pu publishing works a lot when it comes to some of those best practice forums. And also when people see it's more multi-stakeholder involving, I think that is also areas where people look at. And also the open, for instance, I don't know Kenya is actually still involved in areas around open government partnerships where people come and share their, how they actually, people share their platforms. And also those are some of the best practice forums. Even at the AGF, I think they are normally the best practice forums. They are, though they are not legally binding, but I know they are normally best practice forums. People can actually just come and go and was the takeaways. And also, those are some of these ways. But those are one of the immediate things I can think right now, but I'm sure there could be others. Maybe if I sit down, I can probably think of them better in a maybe more concrete way than right now. Yes. Yes, but thank you. Thank you very much, though, yeah. uh, for your comments. Um, I, I would also like to briefly, um, we, we have just three minutes remaining. And I know towards the end, I saw online that the remote hub in Bangladesh um, has, has joined us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Um, I just wanted to, to, to acknowledge, acknowledge your presence there. Um, one thing in, uh, in wrapping up the session, we have uh, two minutes remaining. In terms of 
the legal binding aspect of the mechanisms of the DSA and the sort of uh, perspective of developing human rights-based database systems. What are some, I guess, parting recommendations for uh, strengthening the legal bindingness of such an agency like the DSA? Um, we, we need to really get to a standpoint in which from an ethical perspective, we need to have more things uh, developed and on the books, if you will, that are not just nice to have, but that are legally binding. And in terms of uh, an approach to this, uh, what would be a concrete step that could work globally? I just wanted to put that out there as an additional question to the audience. That, in, that is to say, in addition to the ones on the slides. And anyone can respond. I think for, for if, if, if definitely if you're going to mention something on a legal binding basis, definitely it has to come from government agencies or maybe the data protection agencies that are, that are involved. That is probably just my, my one way of thinking around some of this thing because it can't be binding if you don't involve definitely stakeholders. So it has to be a multi-stakeholder yeah. approach. Even if mm -hmm. it has to be on a global policy level, I think also regionalizing it is very important because there could be global standards, but also I think also it has to be, my view is also it has to also to be localized in some of those, as much as the, the global standards mm -hmm. have to be localized because uh, it, like someone mentioned, human rights might not mean in Kenya might not be the same as Uganda, might not be the same as Tanzania. Yeah. So I think that is also something also that also needs also to be taken into account. So there could be best practice for them at, at the global level, but also the, work, the real work is also how do you localize some of these things mm -hmm. at regional level? Because mm -hmm. uh, I, one way of doing that, there are bodies in Africa, is just as much as there's also the AU, there are bodies such as the ECOWAS, the, AU, the Eastern African Confederation, the SAD. Those are the bodies which are, I think they are actually having also initiatives. And I think these are discussions that they would really welcome in some of their forums in terms mm -hmm. of also how to move forward. Yeah. Apparently, the, the, if you approach some of these bodies, they're very open if you have probably some of, you know, if you have like, uh, like especially in such some of these uh, discussions, people are open to listen to them, uh, to listen to such open discussions. And uh, mm -hmm. it might take time, but I would say, at least a better tech time, but the progress is there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. Uh, well, we are out of time. It is now uh, 101. Um, we thank you all very much for your participation uh, and for your patience and, and uh, your presence here at our session. Uh, Dr. Tauknitz, would you like to say any parting words? Yes, thank you to everybody um, who participated here, both um, in Katowice and uh, online. I think this is an ongoing discussion and um, like whoever would, uh, would like to continue this discussion, um, please get in contact um, with us. Um, I think uh, also Professor Kirschlager, who could unfortunately not be here with us, um, he would be very open to, to address any of your questions. And um, you can either find the contact um, on the website of the Institute of Social Ethics, or maybe Aaron, you can also share it online again with us. So um, yes, please, um, let's continue the discussion. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and share on the chat um, a link to the website of the organization. Just one moment, please. I'm loading it. There we are. There we are. All of the contact information 
for the Institute is, is at that address, is at that website. Uh, we thank you all very much for your participation and for your time um, and for your comments. They're very helpful and, and for the critical discussion. Um, we wish you all a, a wonderful rest of the conference at Katowice at the, this year's Internet Governance Forum. Thank you very much. You will be in touch.